a different perspective, a new insight into life, a nugget of positivity and a hidden truth, and maybe an amusement for you. Welcome to From My Standpoint, a twice a month podcast with your host, Josh C. Jones. Hello there. Uh, I appreciate you tuning in again to From My Standpoint. I'm your host, Josh C. Jones. If this is your first time listening, then I thank you for tuning in. And if it's not, well, thank you for coming back. And don't forget that if you prefer to read, I suggest you check out the blog at FromTheirStandpoint.com. That's from, T-H-E-I-R, Standpoint.com, where I will sometimes add links and some extra information that may not make it to the podcast. So let's begin this episode with questions. Why not, right? Does your comfort, your luxuries, your quality of life, your fear, do they control or corrupt your personality, your emotions, your character to the point that you have no solid foundation anymore upon which to stand when, in, when adversity comes knocking at your door? If the political winds can blow upon your sails and change the direction in which you face and go, then your foundation is not anchored. It is malleable. It is inconsistent. And this will show in your personality. Your character will be the chameleon with which your children and the next generation might very well emulate because it is what you have chosen to allow to cultivate. I like that. I want to say that again. And yes, I wrote that. Yay, go me. Your character will be the chameleon with which your children and the next generation might very well emulate because it is what you have chosen to allow to cultivate. By not having a solid, firm, absolute, immovable foundation for your life, that is what I think greatly helps cause the floods of chaos, confusion, hopelessness, negativity, evil, and hate to sweep your feet out from under you and carry you to a life of self-justifications, rationalizations, and dearism. As my mom, Judy B. Jones, is quoted in my book, Volume 1, The Foundation to Your Success. Yep, quote by Judy B. Jones. You need to have a foundation in order to start anything. In today's climate, having a solid foundation on which to stand is vital to survive the adversity of the storm. As I also say in my book, uh, Volume 1, The Foundation to Your Success, quote, Our foundation is the soil in which all we do and achieve and pass on to the next generation is planted, grown, and harvested. End quote. <laughs> I may be wise <laughs> with a quote like that. Oh, full confession, though, since I do want to be honest on here and clear, when I do say that, that I am wise, I am being biased toward myself, obviously. But this is backed up a lot. Now, I am going to use a story here to help explain some things, because, well, we like stories, and stories really do help get points across because it, it explains a lot of things that we are going through in our world, in our nation, communities today, uh, at least when this was recorded. And this story is from the Bible, but I do believe it is universal and can be viewed to help all of us. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 20, we see the king of Israel, King Ahab, quickly and easily give in to the demands of the king of Syria, Be King Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad mustered all his forces in Syria and 32 other kings. Then he used intimidation to coerce King Ahab into bowing a knee to him and showing absolute support for him, for his perception as king, for his cause, for his selfish desires and wants, for his greed, for his evil, for his need for power and control. And King Benadad tried to force King Ahab to concede to King Benadad's will and demands by threatening King Ahab and his people, his supporters, with violence. Yes, it's right there in the word. It says he 
threaten them with violence, with looting, burning, destruction, and even death. Ben-Hadad sent messengers to get in Ahab's face and deliver the threats. Ben-Hadad's messengers say in 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. Why does this sound somewhat familiar? <laughs> Maybe because we have all faced a threat before in our lives that takes without asking, and that wishes to do harm to our family. It sounds like a powerful person who rallies other powerful people together, who then demand and manipulate their followers to carry out their evil and destructive demands. Hmm, that it actually does, random voice of reason. King Ahab was an Israelite king. So, he must have had a very strong foundation that could not be swayed or coerced or intimidated by evil and threats of lawlessness, right? <sighs> oh, one would assume, random voice of questions. But no. As we can see in, uh, in the Bible, the Israelites often gave in to their selfish desires, to their emotions, to their feelings, to their fear and gave in to sin, gave in to wickedness, gave in to threats. And Ahab might have been king, but he was still human. Ahab immediately cowered and gave in to the threat. He let go of his foundation. He ignored law. He ignored decency. He ignored his duties. He ignored his people, and he ignored God. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 4, it says, The king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. King Ahab didn't even question. He just said yes. He said yes to coercion. Yes to intimidation. Yes to abandoning his values and principles and duty and God and he said yes to evil. Hold, hold on a moment. Why do you keep calling it evil? That is a really good question, random voice of questions. You almost always bring up some really good questions. Evil is defined by Merriam-Webster as arising from bad character or conduct, causing harm, morally reprehensible, sinful, wicked, and as I say in episode 11, the episode titled Support, How Do We Vote? Wicked is morally reprehensible. Whoa, wait, wait. Wicked has one of the same meanings as evil? Yeah, wicked is evil and evil is wicked. In that episode, I also say, quote, Sin could be transgression against the law of one's deity. It can also be wickedness, a wrong, an error, a lapse in judgment or character. Each person is with faults, and each person has moments of frailty. Not one of us is perfect. End quote. So, King Ahab had a lapse in judgment. He made an error with his submission, his immediate submission, to evil. He allowed his fear and complacent and comfortable quality of lifestyle to reshape his character by cracking his foundation and allowing the political winds, allowing the threats, allowing the evil to blow his sails and take his life, his character, his people he was sworn to protect, his nation, take it all off course, away from God, away from what was good and right, and towards submission to evil. King Ahab was human. He was frail. He experienced complacency. He experienced a quality of life and material things in life that he was unwilling to let go of to stand firm against threats of evil and coercion from what was good and right. He experienced fear. 
He gave in to wickedness, just as we all have, and most likely will again at points in our lives. King Ahab was not perfect, and neither are we. Anyway, King Ahab believed that by giving in to evil, to coercion, to threats, and by giving up his beliefs, his foundation, by giving up his God and the stance for good, that King Benadad would not follow through on his threats, his bullying, and that the situation would be over and forgotten, gone with the wind. But as Winston Churchill once said, quote, An appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. End quote. Man, that is a really good quote. I'm going to say that again. An appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. And that is exactly what King Ahab did. He tried to appease the evil and wicked King Benadad and the bullies that followed his commands. King Ahab gave in to King Benadad's selfish, violent, and power-grabbing desires. Sadly, that rarely, if ever, works when dealing with violent, angry, coercive people, or mobs, that demand submission and payment through force and threats of violence, burning, destruction, and death. More often than not, their thirst is never quenched. Their stated desires are never satisfied, and their selfish justifications, rationalizations, and ascription to deism keeps their uncontrollable passion for control, for power, for submission, for personal desire, burning even after their lawless actions and bullying tactics result in their first prescribed demands being met, oftentimes burning brighter and fiercer than before. Well, it seems King Ahab didn't listen to the wise words of Winston Churchill. That's probably because Ahab was born thousands of years before Churchill. But Churchill, speaking about the evils of World War II, it still works just as well in other situations such as this one. But Churchill did say, quote, All of them hope that the storm will pass before their turn comes to be devoured. But I fear, I fear greatly, the storm will not pass. It will rage and it will roar, even ever more loudly, ever more wide, widely. It will spread to the south. It will spread to the north. Whew, Churchill said a lot of uh, really good and enlightening wisdoms, didn't he? And that is exactly what happened. King Benadad, after hearing of King Ahab's quick submission and removal of his own foundation, sent his messengers back to King Ahab with further demands. King Benadad moved the goalpost. He, as well as is attributed to John Haywood, I believe, this old idiom, uh, give them an inch and they will take a mile. And that is exactly what King Benadad was doing. King Ahab gave King Benadad an inch when he immediately caved on his own foundation and gave up good, that which he was commissioned to protect, gave it up for a false promise of temporary security from evil, the same evil that was giving the threats. And evil, King Benadad immediately went for the mile. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 through 6, King Benadad sent his messengers back to King Ahab, saying, Thus says Benadad, I sent to you, saying, Deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. Nevertheless, I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your houses and the houses of your servants and lay hands on what ever pleases you and take it away. King Benadad's inch was theft of all of King Ahab's and his people's money, their wealth, and their surrendering of his family, his wives and children. This sounds kind of familiar too. 
Why is that? <laughs> Because、uh, we have all experienced the intimidation, the bullying, the wickedness of those who would desire to steal from another and to make submissive servants. That is, slaves, if you will, of others. Random voice of questions. But King Benadad's mile then became the breaking and entering into all their homes, into the king's palace, to steal and loot all that was precious, all that had value, all that he and his people were willing to give into wickedness and do evil, to beat and kill people for. Now. This one I know is familiar. I just can't place it. Where have I heard or seen this before? That is for you to figure out on your own. Random voice of questions. Anyway, after the last demand, King Ahab finally regained his footing on his foundation and found his support. He called upon the elders, that is the wisest of them, and asked for the input, you know, for help, for their wisdom. In First Kings chapter twenty verse seven, he said, "Mark now and see how this man is seeking trouble, for he sent to me for my wives and my children, and for my silver and my gold, and I did not refuse him." King Ahab is realizing his mistake. His moment of frailty and seeking wise counsel on how to remedy this and how to proceed further, he sought wise counsel after giving in to bullying, to threats and coercion. But before that mistake could be fully enacted by the aggressor, by King Benadad, they answered him in First Kings chapter twenty verse eight by saying, "Do not listen or consent." Those are wise words. Do not be an appeaser to wickedness, to evil. Do not listen to the threats of the enemy when he speaks of harm, of violence, of destruction, of theft, of looting, of murder. Do not consent to the enemy by kneeling before him and sacrificing your foundation for that of the winds. If King Ahab gave King Benadad the mile. Then they knew that the sovereignty of their land would be no more. King Benadad would not stop at that mile; he would take it all. King Ahab tells King Benadad's servants to relay this message in First Kings chapter twenty, verse nine. He says, "Tell my lord the king, all that you first demanded of your servant, I will do." But this thing I cannot do. King Benadad's response in First Kings, chapter twenty, verse ten, was, "The gods do so to me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for the hands for all the people who follow me." You can give in two portions of an angry mob to evil, to your oppressors, to thugs. But if you even deny them one thing, they will punish you severely, for complete suppression and submission is the ultimate end goal, not the first inch or even the first mile. That was actually really well said, random voice of reason. Thank you. Now back to the story here in First Kings chapter twenty, verse eleven. King Ahab boldly replied, "Tell him, let not him who straps on his armor boast himself as he who takes it off." What does that mean? Well, random voice of questions. From what I can understand, and from what my research has shown, this was King Ahab's wisdom to King Benadad. It was also a bold speech showing. King Ahab would no longer be bullied or coerced or threatened unlawfully any more. Oh, okay. So now that King Ahab told King Benadad that he would not cower or cave or kneel before his suppression any more, what did King Benadad do? King Benadad did what all wicked, evil, hate-filled mobs and tyrants do. Random voice of questions. He set up for attack. 
he set up to begin his war against those he was trying to oppress. However, the Lord was with King Ahab. Even though King Ahab faltered and succumbed to the fear instilled by the enemy, he repented. He sought wise counsel, he got back on the right path, and he stood firm in his foundation. We will all falter and give in to sin, to wickedness sometimes, but even when we do, we still have a choice. We can continue down that path of violence, of wickedness, of destruction, of hopelessness and evil, or we can repent. We can turn from that path of destruction and turn back to hope, to peace, to love, to tolerance, to forgiveness. We can turn back to the good path. King Benadad did not follow the wisdom of King Ahab, no, not about boasting, as he was drinking on the battlefield the day of the battle. That was dumb. What happened next? Well, King Ahab and his people, the Israelites, stood up to evil, to wickedness, to the bullies, to the tyrannical King Benadad and his violent followers, and defeated them in great numbers on the battlefield. That was what happened next, random voice of questions. Also, King Benadad fled. Wickedness and evil were defeated. They did not receive their complete and utter submission or power they demanded and desired. They did not receive their mile of robbery and looting and theft. They did not receive their inch which was offered in the first demands of wealth and women and children to be their slaves. No, they lost it all. But just as is the case with most oppressive, suppressive, submission-demanding, tyrannical figures and groups seeking power and control, they took time to heal and to muster their forces once again for another attack, a more violent and widespread attack. But this time, they came back to attack and defeat God, the God of the Israelites, and to prove their status as lords. That's another one. Why does getting rid of God and trying to wage war on God sound so familiar too? <laughs> Once again, random voice of questions, you bring up a lot of good questions, but that one is for you to figure out an answer for yourself. Anyway, when they attacked fellow man, their defeat on the battlefield was swift, but they were able to flee with their lives, to have that chance to try to repent and turn back from their evil ways. But when they came back to attack God, their defeat on the battlefield was swift, but even those who fled were met with demise. The Israelites killed 100,000 Syrian foot soldiers. No idea how many other soldiers, it doesn't say. And the 27,000 that were able to flee were crushed under their own fortress built upon, as I say in my book, Volume 1, The Foundation to Your Success, quote, a shaky, conditional, and fluctuating foundational base, end quote. <laughs> Man, I think that's, what, three times now I've got that in there? I'm doing pretty good. It works, too, because it says in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 30, And the rest fled into the city of Aphek, and the wall fell upon 27,000 men who were left. Booyah! See, my book works. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, after that, Benadad was defeated, and so were his people, his followers. Benadad had his uh, servants who were left with him go to King Ahab and plead for Ben Hadad's life. Benadad, the one who first demanded complete submission, who used intimidation, bullying, and force to achieve power and control to have Ahab and his people kneel before his will and his power and his cause, was now the one kneeling and begging for forgiveness and for his life. What did King Ahab say? What did he do? Well, random voice of questions. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 32, King Ahab said, Does he, he's speaking about Benadad, 
Does he still live? He is my brother. Even after all the threats, all the bullying and all the violence and destruction and pain and devastation and wickedness that Benadad unleashed upon Ahab and the Israelites, and even after the war Benadad and his followers demanded and instigated upon King Ahab and the Israelites, King Ahab was still willing to call him his brother. He was still willing to forgive him. But it did not stop there. Ahab went on to spare Benadad's life and give him back part of his kingdom, including the people in those places. Even after all the death and destruction, Benadad received his inch. Evil and wickedness was rewarded. That doesn't sound hopeful or good at all. I can understand forgiveness, but why reward? Why reward evil? So many good questions. But like most of them, that is just something you must answer for yourself. However, this story does have more to it that might help you with that answer, random voice of questions. Soon after, King Ahab was met with a wounded prophet, disguised as a soldier, who told him a story about being in charge of watching a prisoner, but being too busy and preoccupied with other things. He failed at his assignment and the prisoner escaped. He then went on to say that his punishment was supposed to be a talent of silver or his life for the prisoner's life. He was telling King Ahab, the king of the Israelites, that he disobeyed God by not just letting King Benadad live, but by giving him part of his kingdom back along with those whom he can continue to subjugate and enslave for wickedness. King Ahab through what looked like mercy and goodwill in the eyes of man, was disobedience in the eyes of God. It is good to forgive, to show mercy to those who repent. But if that mercy is reward for evil, and if that reward is continued evil, then you have traded one life for another. As usual, that is very well said, random voice of reason. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 42, the prophet said to Ahab, Thus says the Lord, because you have let go out of your hands the man whom I had devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall be for his and your people for his people. King Ahab made a mistake. He showed his frailty by giving in to fear and comfort and giving in to submission to oppression, to bullying, to wickedness, to evil. He then repented of his mistake. He sought wise counsel, he regained his footing on the right path, and he stood firm on his foundation. And because of that, the Lord blessed him with his, and his people and took care of them. The Lord delivered them from the hands of their oppressor, their bully, the tyrannical power that intimidated, harassed, threatened, and sought to loot and burn and destroy and kill him and his people. Yet, even with this miracle, this victory, King Ahab showed his frailty again, not by showing forgiveness or compassion or mercy, but by giving power back to evil who never repented of their wicked ways by subjugating people under the rule of wickedness once again, by turning his back on God's command, and putting those who sought to kill and defeat God, not just King Ahab and his people, but God himself for their own gain and image back in power. Because of this, Ahab and the Israelites would once again suffer under wickedness, under bullies, under oppression, and the sovereignty of their nation would soon come to an end. At least until they repented and turned back to God again. 
If you have not yet subscribed, then I encourage you to subscribe to From My Standpoint to ensure you receive a reminder when new episodes are released. You can follow me on Facebook at FM Standpoint, on Instagram at From My Standpoint, or visit the website www.fromtheirstandpoint.com. That's from T H E I R standpoint.com, and click on my show, From My Standpoint. And now, what you've all been waiting for. It's the Wisdom of Dad Joke. Stories are fantastic learning tools for us, such as in the one we just discussed. King Ahab let fear and complacency and comfort dictate the structure and strength of his foundation. He wavered in his belief, loyalty, and foundation and allowed the current circumstances which happened to be intimidation, threats, bullying, and a tyrannical, power-hungry, wicked, and evil man and his followers to shift the sands of his foundation and cower before adversity, cower before evil. He eventually regained his footing on a strong and firm foundation, just as we all have and can again. Now, this story also reminds me of the message about the construction of our foundation. It's a good story and a great joke about construction. And I would tell you, but we're all still working on it. This has been From My Standpoint, a podcast to find a nugget of positivity and a hidden truth, encouraging and enlightening insight entertaining a new perspective and providing an amusement for you. We hope you were entertained, encouraged, enlightened, and enjoyed the show.